What is up guys, Randy Monium here, back with another video. This video is part of my How to Find Your Ideal Champion stream, which occurred on January 11th. The main portion of that stream was released a few days ago. That portion of the stream helps you identify what subclasses would be best for you. There's also a subclass calculator, which I released as part of that video. So I highly recommend you check that out. The link is in the video description below. If you do use my subclass calculator and you got some melee classes as your top three, this is the video for you. This video is gonna cover the melee classes. It's gonna cover assassins, skirmishers, divers, juggernauts, vanguards, and wardens. There are a few melee champions within the catcher and specialist classes, but the majority of champions within those classes are ranged. So those classes are going to be covered in my ranged champions video, which should be out within a few days of this video. If you want to watch me live, I stream every Saturday starting at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'll be covering a new topic each week, and it's a great place to chill, ask me questions, and theory craft with me. I hope you guys enjoy the video. So last thing I want to talk about, this is a little preview potentially for uh, next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about team compositions. So these are the team compositions. I am going to talk about uh, which classes are good and what team compositions in this video. So I need to introduce this concept to you guys now. So there are five team compositions. There's attack, catch, protect, siege, and split. So attack is all about engaging 5v5 team fights, big huge ultimates, they're typically called wombo combos, things like that, they're team fight comps. They're really designed about starting fights, especially in choke points, especially when ultimates are up, uh, and they are the most common um, team composition that you play. Next up, catch compositions. Catch compositions are usually called like pick comps, things like that. They're really good at, they have like high burst damage, good single target crowd control. They're designed to basically just instantly delete somebody off the map as soon as they show up. They play really well with vision denial, things like that. Um, but yeah, those that's what a catch comp does. Protect comps, uh, most common of these would be like the juggernaut comp. It's usually like you've got one or two, I, pref I highly recommend two, uh, DPS threats, like really, really high DPS threats. You can think like Kale, Cassiopeia, Rise, Kog'Maw, Vayne, those type of champions that are just deal a ton of damage if you can keep them alive. You have a couple of those, and then you have a decent amount of disengage, utility, crowd control, things like that to keep those champions alive as long as possible. But they typically don't have the same engage potential that an attack composition has. Typically, protect compositions are more defensive and attack compositions are more offensive. Siege compositions are next. These are also called poke compositions. So big thing with these siege compositions is they're all about um, basically just winning objectives for free because they basically can just keep poking an, uh, an enemy team until they can't contest the objective anymore. So really, it's all about patience with these type of team compositions which doesn't go well a lot of times with a lot of solo queue players. They're not very patient. The siege compositions are all about patience. They're all about whittling down an opponent. They don't want to fight a fight when both teams are full strength and when they're both teams are full health. They want to whittle down their opponents first. And then finally, we've got the split compositions. This is your standard YOLO style uh, solo queue composition. You got a Trindamir top lane. He's going to split push no matter what, things like that. That's a split push composition. Uh, typically, you can have a 1-4 or 1-3-1. Uh, basically, if you have one split pusher or two, uh, these comps are really great because you allow you can do pressure in multiple lanes, but they're really hard to execute because if you over push in one of the lanes, you'll get collapsed upon, you'll get killed. So if you're not playing a split pusher, what you need for the other members of the team, either the three or the four, is you need wave clear and you need disengage. Those are really kind of the big things because the enemy team is going to want to engage on somebody. Usually the split pusher can get away, and if they can't get onto the split pusher, they're going to try and engage onto you. So that's why you need wave clear. That's why you need ways to get away. You need some form of disengaged crowd control. You need some form of utility to get away, that type of stuff. So in general, uh, each team composition is good against two team compositions, and they're bad against two team compositions. And then obviously, if it's a mirror matchup, it's 50-50. Uh, so you can see that the arrows point to which team composition uh, that team composition is strong against. So attack compositions are good against split compositions, and they're good against siege compositions. They're weak against protect compositions and catch compositions. And the same thing goes around the circle. So if gonna, for example, protect compositions are good against catch and attack, they're weak against split and siege. 
talk about this more in a lot of detail next week on my team composition video, but I want to give you guys a little bit of a taster so you guys can understand uh, when I'm talking about team compositions for the rest of this video. Okay, let's get into the uh, let's get into the classes. So first class we're going to talk about is assassins, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think everybody knows assassins. These are the the champions that give uh, pretty much every squishy champion in the game nightmares. Uh, I know that whenever when I used to be an AD carry main, I used to dread it whenever I would see an assassin picked on the enemy team because I was like, okay, well I guess I don't get to have fun this game. But uh, yeah, assassins are uh, the first class we're going to talk about. And the big thing about assassins is that they're high risk, high reward. The, these really are the champions. If you are interested in like uh, a lot of outplays, things like that, assassins are really good for that. Skirmishers are too, but assassins are really high risk, high reward. Um, they have tons of mobility. They've got tons of burst damage, but they really lack like crowd control, utility, toughness, those type of things. So you're basically like S tier when it comes to mobility and damage and you're you know really really weak when it comes to crowd control utility and toughness. The defining aspect of assassins is their escapes. So there's plenty of classes that can build full damage, right? You can you can play full damage Jarvan, you can play full damage Malphite. Um, but it doesn't make them assassins. The assassins, you got to have the escape. Assassins, it's really important that they're able to get in, but they're also able to get out. And they're the only class that can, can do that. Uh, it's not simply just jump in, blow somebody up, and then die. They actually have the ability to jump in, blow somebody out, and then get out and stay alive, which is really useful because you can basically turn any team fight from a 5v5 to a 5v4. As far as roles that assassins are most commonly played in, it's mid, jungle, and top. Top, not that much. It's mainly mid and jungle uh, that you'll see assassins played in. And it's typically, there are certain assassins that are played mid lane, there are certain assassins that are played jungle, and the, the two don't mix. Um, but those are the two most common roles that assassins are played in. And as far as team compositions, you're really looking at catch and split are the two team compositions that our assassins are best in. There are certain assassins that are really, really good in, a, in attack compositions. I'm mainly thinking of like Katarina and Kiana are really, really good, and also Akali to a little bit of a lesser extent. Um, they can be really good in attack compositions, but in general, if you're going to draft an assassin, you're looking more towards either a catch composition or a split composition. So, as far as the um, where they fall on their escapes. So, the big thing that, that defines the assassins is the escapes. So, that's how I'm breaking them out so you can see what type of assassins. There's stealth, there's mobility, and there's evasiveness. So, there are the three types of escapes you can have. So stealth is either, um, what is it, there's camouflage and there's invisibility are the two different types of stealth, if I remember correctly. Either short uh, duration stealth or long duration stealth. You've got mobility, which is just really short cooldown dashes and things like that. And you've got evasiveness, which is basically like untargetability. So there's things that basically prevent you from being able to take damage and things like that. There are certain abilities that allow you to do that. Um, so as far as stealth is concerned, you're mainly talking about like your Evelyns, your Shakos, your Kha'Zix. Kiana and Talon obviously have a little bit of stealth. Akali has got her shroud. But uh, really, when I'm thinking about stealth assassins, I'm thinking about Evelyn, Shako, and Kha'Zix for the most part. Mobility, you definitely have got Talon, Kiana have got a lot of mobility. But the, the kind of like the true mobility assassins, when I think of them, are Kassin and Katarina. They don't really have any other form of... Um, escapes besides their mobility, and they're really reliant upon their, those mobility spells. And then when it comes to evasiveness, is Fizz and Zed. Fizz and Zed, extremely evasive champions. Akali can also be grouped into those evasive champions. Uh, they have ways of just basically just dropping aggro really, really quickly. Uh, it makes them very frustrating. It makes them very slippery to play against. Uh, as far as the classes that the um, assassins are most common to, um, it's so, for example, on the stealth side, if you're talking about like stealth evasiveness type of stuff, it's the catchers. So, uh, Pike is the most similar to Evelyn and Shaco when it comes to, you know, where I'm drawing the line of assassin and where I'm drawing the line for catcher. A lot of people consider Pike an assassin. I consider him a catcher, but I think he's the catcher that is closest to the assassin class. Same is true for Echo. So Echo, a lot of people consider him an assassin. I consider him a skirmisher based off of his W and his ultimate and things like that. And he, but he is the closest skirmisher 
to the uh, evasive assassin. So he's the closest skirmisher to champions like Fizz and Zed. Then when you get onto the mobility side, you've got both burst mages and divers that are really similar to some of the mobility assassins. So on the burst mage side, uh, I think that Ari and LeBlanc are really similar to Talon and Cassidy. Uh, the main difference is that Ari and LeBlanc, their range, they have a bit more range than both the Talon and the Kassadin. Uh They've got ranged auto attacks, their abilities have a little bit more range, things like that. Obviously, I have to say that Kha'Zix is really similar to Rengar. I include Rengar with the Divers. I know everybody says he's an assassin, but Rengar doesn't have an escape, so that puts him more into the Diver category. And he does have a really, really great form of uh, toughness from his W. The, I think people really underestimate how good his W is. Um, and then as far as some other divers that are similar to assassins, I think that Wukong and Diana are very similar to Katarina. Diana even more so now after the rework with her new ultimate. Um, I do consider Wukong and Diana to be divers. Uh, Wukong can use his stealth as a way to um, escape, but generally he's using his stealth as an engage tool rather than an escape tool uh, because his, his dashes are usually really short ranged. So, yeah, so those are the relationships of the classes. You can see that assassins, they've, they, they touch a lot of areas, but you can see that um, all of them are those offensive classes with the exception of the skirmishers. Skirmishers were considered a defensive class. So that is assassins. So we're going to move on to skirmishers. So skirmishers um, really are, they're the best duelists in the game. They're, they're just the best duelists in the game. They're high skill cap usually. Um, you can't face roll with them a lot of times. Um, they do require you to have some uh, some really significant knowledge on matchups and combos and things like that. Uh, and in general, there there's a lot of one tricks who are skirmish remains. Th that's just the truth of it. There's there's so many like Fiora and Irelia and Riven and Yasuo one tricks that is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, so skirmishers are the best duelists, and they're probably the most common one tricks that you'll see. So pros, as we've already said, best duelists, high damage, high mobility. Uh, their damage is also kind of split. It's not just DPS or burst, it's both, which means that they're really, really good against both tanky targets and squishy targets. Um, cons, not as tanky. Low utility, very skill dependent. Uh, you, if you're new with a skirmisher, chances are you're not going to be very good, and you're going to you're going to be like, I don't understand why this champion is good. But they are good; they're really good. Uh, and the reason why they're good is their conditional defenses. This is really the thing that defines a skirmisher: is they've got really, really high damage, but they've got conditional defenses. And if those conditional defenses are used properly, they're really tanky and they can survive a really long time. And if you don't use them properly, then you'll die in uh, about less than a second, pretty much. So the conditional defenses are super important when it comes to skirmishers, uh, and it really uh, they're really skill expressive. As far as roles, most common role is top. Uh, you also see some skirmishers in jungle and mid as well, but top is the main role for skirmishers. As far as team compositions, you're looking at split is the most common uh, for skirmishers. They are fantastic split pushers. They can also be used in catch or attack compositions. Uh, I would say catch more than attack but they can be used in both. So as far as the uh, where everybody lies and as far as what the conditional defenses are that you can have. So the conditional defenses that skirmishers can have, mobility, durability, and threat. So mobility is pretty self-explanatory. It's being able to dash all over the place and avoid crowd control, avoid AOE damage, things like that. Durability is a little bit more nebulous. It has to do with having certain abilities that either prevent you from dying or that can negate a large amount of damage. So you can see like Trindomir's, his uh, undying effect, Kled's remount effect, Jax's counter strike, all these abilities make them really, really tanky, way more tanky than they, their base stats would indicate. And then threat has to do with like large AOE abilities that can single-handedly win fights. So you can think about like if Fiora gets all four vitals in a team fight, her entire team is going to heal a ridiculous amount. If Yasuo lands a five-man ultimate, if Echo lands a five-man uh, W or a five-man ultimate, it's pretty much game over for those type of fights. So they have a huge amount of threat level that they can use as a conditional defense because teams are just really afraid of them. 
as far as classes that um, are most similar to skirmishers. So we've already talked about the assassins. Um, the evasion assassins are most common to Echo. So Zed and Fizz, most common to Echo. You can see that Echo is the uh, skirmisher that is most like the assassins, and he is really high mobility, really high threat. So the, if you get more mobility, more threat, you get into that assassin region. When we get into uh, skirmishers, they're also really common to divers. So you can see that I've got that Renekton is really similar to uh, Riven and Kled. And I've got Camille is really similar to Trindamir, Irelia, and Jax. So you can see if you get more into the durability, more into the mobility, you start getting into more of a diver region when it comes to uh, champion design and things like that. Big difference, obviously, is divers don't have those conditional defenses like the skirmishers do, but divers tend to have some more innate tankiness, either through sustain or shields that they have uh, that are more just like straight up defenses. And then if you go more towards the durability and the threat side, that's when you start getting into juggernauts. So you can see that uh, Alawi and Yorick, I say that they're most in common with Fjord and Kled. So if you get like really, really more threat, really more durability, you're gonna start getting into those raid boss juggernauts. So a Fiora ultimate has a very similar to an Alawi ultimate, where if a Fiora or an Alawi lands those ultimates in a big team fight, uh, it, it pretty much can win the team fight for their team. So yeah, so those are the classes that skirmishers are most alike. I know there's gonna be people who disagree with me on where one line ends and another line begins, but this is where I put them. Okay, we're going to move on to the fighter classes. The first fighter class we're going to talk about are the divers. Uh, this is arguably my favorite class. I could say it probably is my favorite class. I've got a ton of mastery on all these champions. So this is kind of, if you know what my favorite child is, this is my favorite child probably. It's the divers. I freaking love these guys. So reason why I love them is that they're they're really flexible. They're they're kind of they got good damage, they got good mobility, they've got good toughness, they got good crowd control. They're just really flexible when it comes to their stats and they're really flexible when it comes to their build path. So you can build them full damage, you can build them full tank, you can build them somewhere in between with one or two damage items. Uh, they're really easy to learn too. Most of the divers are really, really low skill floor. They might still have a high skill ceiling, but they have a low skill floor. There are some exceptions, obviously like Lee Sin, for example, uh, not an easy champion to pick up, but most of the divers are really easy to pick up and they're really kind of good champions for beginners. Cons of divers is that they have, they're basically masters of none. So they're jack of all trades, um, but they're masters of none. They're not the best in anything. They're, they don't have the best damage. They don't have the best crowd control. They don't have the best mobility. But they're good. They're really good in just about every category. And they've got really low utility. That's another downside of divers is they've got next to no utility. As far as roles are concerned, uh, the main roles for divers are jungle, top, and mid. Jungle is the main one. Top, a little bit less so. Mid, less than that. As far as compositions are concerned, they're best in catch and attack. You can pretty much stick any diver into an, a, catch, a catch comp or an attack comp. Uh, they also can be used in split and protect, but it's more situational there. There's only certain divers that can split push. There's only certain divers that are decent in protect compositions. It's more situational. It's harder to do, but you can work them in if you need to. So as far as where everybody falls on the diver spectrum. So I, I had to split up into four quadrants because divers are a huge class. So on the top, you've got the divers that are more like combo based. So they're not as auto attack reliant. They still use auto attacks, but they're more ability reliant. And on the bottom side, we've got the attack based um, uh, divers that still like their abilities, but they also are going to auto attack you to death. On the left, we've got the mitigation divers. And on the right, we've got the sustain divers. Mitigation, obviously more shields. Sustain is more healing. So top left, Wukong, Pantheon, Diana, Lee Sin, and uh, Wukong and Diana are most common to the assassins, mainly Katarina, um, in the mobility side of the assassin tree. On the upper right, we've got Hecram, Rengar, Rek'Sai, and Renekton. You can see that Rengar, very similar to Kha'Zix on the assassin side, and then Renekton, very similar to Riven and Kled. If we go to bottom left, We've got Jarvan, Nocturne, and Vi, so this is a mitigation and attack. These champions most had in common with vanguards, with the, uh, the isolate vanguards like Sejuani and Nautilus. And then bottom right, we've got Camille, Warwick, and Zin Zhao, so this is sustain and attack. Uh, so Camille, most in common with Irelia, Trindamir, and Jax. 
And then we've got uh, Warwick and Zen Zhao, most in common with the freight train juggernauts, Olaf, Skarner, and Shivana. So you can see that the diver class really is kind of a crossroads for a lot of classes. You can go all the way to full assassin, or you can go all the way to full tank from the diver class. And this is one of the other reasons why I really would like recommend divers to a beginner player or somebody who doesn't really know what they want because if you figure out how much you like divers you can usually figure out where you want to go from there so for example if you play a diver and you're like uh divers aren't tanky enough for me well that's easy then you go to vanguards right um if you're like uh divers don't have enough damage well that's easy then you go more towards assassins or skirmishers or if you say, oh, I, I, want, I want the damage, I want the tankiness, but I don't really need the mobility that the divers have, then that puts you more towards the juggernauts. So divers are really kind of a good litmus test to figure out where you fall. If you know you want to play a melee champion, I would say pick up divers, and then you can kind of explore from there. Okay, so let's get into the juggernauts. So juggernauts, these, these are, yeah, these this is the class that... Um, yeah, you can make plenty of memes about this class. You can, you know, they always like those odds. They're never, uh, they're never stuck in, inside with you. You're stuck inside with them. Those type of memes. There's plenty of memes when it comes to juggernauts, and most of them are true. Juggernauts really are kind of the best class when it comes to one v twoing, one v threeing, one v fiving. Yeah, they can, they can do all that. So, juggernauts, high tankiness, conditional damage. Uh, that's one of the big things that that. Um, that we identified is that skirmishers, uh, high damage, conditional defense, juggernauts, uh, conditional damage, high defense. So hopefully that makes sense. Other big thing is that uh, juggernauts are really strong duelists. So they can they can go toe to toe with a lot of the skirmishers. Um, yeah, I'll let I'll let chat fight it out whether juggernauts or skirmishers are better when it comes to dueling. But they're both like really scary when it comes to their dueling power if me playing a diver or a vanguard i want i want nothing to do with a skirmisher or a juggernaut when it comes to a duel uh, as far as our cons are concerned they're really kiteable they don't have a lot of mobility you can kite them usually pretty easily they don't have the best crowd control uh there are exceptions to that rule and they typically have really low utility as far as the roles are played typically top and jungle a few can go mid but typically top and jungle um, and they can be used in pretty much every single team composition. Uh, they're best in split and protect, but there are some that are good in catch. There are a few that are good in siege, and there are some that are good in attack. More situational when it comes to catch and siege and attack. Traditionally, you'll see them in split compositions and protect compositions. Um, if you're going to draft them into those other ones, the catch, siege, attack, you got to do a little bit more homework and figure out how you can enable them better. Otherwise, they're going to be kind of useless in those compositions. So where do all these champions lie on the spectrum for Juggernaut? So you can see that there's two types. There's raid bosses and there's freight trains. So raid bosses are kind of these big immobile Raid bosses, like think of like WoW or some other type of MMO. Uh, it takes multiple people to bring them down. They are just ridiculously tanky. Uh, they deal a ton of damage. Um, they don't. They don't care. They give zero zero fucks when it comes to uh, who you try to send at them. Uh, and they kind of break the rules. People would say, but the big thing is that they're not mobile. They're like the most immobile class in the game. Freight trains. They're a little bit more balanced. They may not have as much tankiness or as much damage as the raid bosses, but they've got more mobility. And they typically also have a little bit more crowd control. And their mobility is usually like movement speed boosts. So there's a lot of movement speed boosts when it comes to the freight trains. So upper left, we've got the freight, the, sorry, we've got the raid bosses that primarily are more ability focused. We've got Alawi, Mordekaiser, Darius, Urgot. These are like your traditional raid bosses that you just want to stay away from. Um, you can see that the skirmishers are have most in common with the raid bosses. So Alawi and Yorick have most in common with Fiora and Kled. On the ability side, 
Uh, you can see that Darius and Aatrox have the most in common with battle mages Vladimir and Swain. So these are the tanky battle mages Vladimir and Swain have the most in common with ability-based uh, juggernauts. So that's the relationship between battle mages and juggernauts. We go into the upper right. So we've got the raid bosses that deal more with attacks. I've got Yorick, Nasus, Trundle, and Set. I'm adding Set to uh, the raid bosses on the attack side. He may move. All right, he's, he's brand new, but that's where I'm going to slot him right now. Uh, typically, you can see that these champions, a lot of times they've got auto attack resets. They've got empowered auto attacks, that type of stuff. You know, Yorick, Nasus, Trundle all have empowered auto attacks on their Q. And they typically turn into terrifying monsters when you press R. R. Um, set is a little bit different, but I think he still fits into that group. Uh, we go to the bottom left. So you can see you've got the freight trains that are ability-based. We got Aatrox, Mundo, Garen, and Skarner. I already talked about the Aatrox, very similar to Battle Mages. Uh, additionally, if you look at the bottom, you can see that freight trains like Skarner, Olaf, Shivana have most in common with um, the attack sustain divers like Warwick and Zen Zhao. So I'd say like Warwick and Olaf, very similar uh, types of champions, that type of stuff. And then bottom right, we've got Udir, Volibear, Olaf, and Shivana. Those are the freight trains that are more auto attack based. Volibear, obviously, his rework is pending. I don't have any details on the rework, so he's still um, a freight train who's based on auto attacks. He may move after his rework. Uh, additionally, the attack based juggernauts, Trundle and Volibear, have, are most in common with wardens, so Tom Kench and Shen. And kind of surprisingly, like I actually made this graphic like way before uh, this happened, but the only juggernauts that have been played in competitive in the support position have been Trundle and Volibear, to my knowledge. I mean, as far as like, there might be like a one-off playing some other juggernauts in the support role, but as far as like what was meta, Trundle has been a meta support and Volibear has been a meta support uh, at the professional level and they have the most in common with the wardens which is considered more of a supportive class so i feel like that's kind of a good tie-in uh between those classes all right so now we're going to get into the tanky classes and first up we've got the vanguards so uh, the name vanguard actually has some historical meaning to it so since i'm, I'm a military nerd I'll, I'll let you in on that. So the vanguard was usually like the frontal assault. It was usually like the advanced guard. It was usually the pointy tip of the spear. It was the people that would scout ahead and would start the battle. They would be at like the front of the charge, basically. And that's really the role that vanguards play in League of Legends as well. They are the team fight starters. They are the people that are first man in. They're basically ultimate. They're first in. They deal, you know, a bunch of AoE damage and the rest of their team follows up. So these are the, 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 the champions that start the team fights. So vanguards, pros, big AoE crowd control. AoE damage, not a ton of it, but they deal a decent amount of AoE damage. Super high tankiness, and they are uh, the best engagers in the game when it comes to, the, like, nobody starts a fight like a Vanguard. As far as their cons, low damage, and also low utility in general. Their roles, jungle top support. Uh, they have played almost equally in all three of those roles. And then as far as compositions... Attack comps. Like, attack comps, like, scream vanguards. So, typically, like, if you if draft a vanguard, you're most likely going for an attack comp. You can pivot later on, but um, vanguard scream, attack comp. They also can be decent in catch comps and protect comps. Okay. As far as the different types of vanguards, we've got the wombo vanguards, which are just, like, a big AoE ultimate, uh, start the team fight type of stuff. Like, the, I would say the most traditional We've got the flanking uh, vanguards, which rely more on flanks, and but they usually have like really big abilities, um, or they're like ridiculously fast. In the case of Ramus, you can see like uh, Cyan comes in like a bat out of hell, does big AOE crowd control that type of stuff. Orn and Maokai, those big ultimates uh, that are really good at cutting off retreat paths for enemies and basically force them to fight. And then you've got the isolate vanguards, which. They're a little bit worse when it comes to their AoE crowd control, but their single target crowd control or their ability to uh, isolate one champion from the rest of their team is really, really strong. So you can think like Gragas Cask and like knock somebody forward into your team. Sejuani Ultimate, Nautilus Ultimate, Alistar can headbutt somebody away or headbutt somebody into your team, that type of stuff. 
So as far as the uh, classes that the vanguards are most uh, common or most alike to, so you can see that the isolated vanguards are most in common with the divers. So I've got Sejuani and Nautilus most in common with Jarvan and Vi. That's because the divers, they're, they're really good at single target crowd control, single target damage. That's kind of their purpose. They maybe don't have the same AoE damage or the same AoE crowd control as a lot of the vanguards, but they're really great when it comes to single target kind of stuff. As far as the Wombo Vanguards, they have most in common with the mobility catchers, mainly Rakan. So you can see that I have Rakan being very similar to Malphite and Zac as far as their role when it comes to a team composition. Uh, and then when it comes to the flanking Vanguards, I say that they are most in common with the Warden. So I have uh, Galio and Poppy from the Warden class are most in common with Orn, Scion, and Maokai. So speaking of Wardens, let's get into the Warden class. So Warden, again, also has some really good con connotations to it. A Warden is some type of a protector. You know, you, you think of like a big burly knight who's protecting their king or something like that. That's really what Wardens are. They're really kind of the more protective, uh, tanky class, and they're really good at their jobs. So high tankiness, um, good utility, good crowd control, all that stuff. Uh, they are arguably the most well-rounded class in the game. Like, they've, they've got everything. Like, they've got a little bit of mobility. Uh, they got decent utility. Uh, they've got good crowd control, really high tankiness. Probably the place where they're, they're the weakest is probably their damage. But even their damage can be high in certain cases. So, extremely tough. Good crowd control, good utility, strong disengage. Cons, low damage, situational engage. So, Wardens... They're best used as a secondary engage or as a disengage. Um, so as far as their roles are concerned, they're mainly played support and top. Uh, they also can be played jungle and mid on occasion. There's a few that can be played jungle and mid. And the big thing with Wardens is they're really, they really can fit into just about every single team composition. So um, I am a pretty strong advocate for Wardens. I think that they are underpicked. They're underrepresented when it comes to a lot of coordinated play. But they really can slot into a team composition and you can pick them early in the draft and you're not really showing where you're going with your team composition by picking a warden. It gives you a lot of versatility to pivot to one team composition or another later in the draft. So they're best in protect, siege, and split because they're, they're more defensive, they're more better at disengage and protection, that type of stuff. But they can work and catch and attack if you draft like a vanguard or a diver that they can combo their engage off of so wardens aren't going to be your primary engager but they can be a really good secondary engager to follow up on the engage of a diver or a vanguard so as far as where they fall i've split the the wardens up into three areas protection control and engage so protection is more like utility focus control is more like controlling space like basically you know, preventing people from moving through a certain area. And engage is more along the sides of they want to start fights, they're a little bit more damage focused, that type of stuff. So you can see that when it comes to like, if you call cross protection and control, uh, the uh, wardens that are most in common uh, to the enchanter class. So you can see Tarek and Braum, who are kind of like straddling protection and control, have the most in common with enchanters like Soraka and Janna. If you get more to the protection and engage side, you can see that we've got the Wardens, uh, Tom Kench and Chen, who are most in common with the Juggernauts we just talked about previously, Trundle and Volibear. Uh, so you can see there's that relationship between the Juggernauts and the Wardens. And then when you get more to the control and the engage side, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. If you get purely into the control side, you've got that Wardens are similar to Battle Mages. So you can see Nunu and Galio, most in common with Rumble and Anivia on the Battle Mage side. They're really good at controlling space. And then Galio, again, is also really in common with Maokai, Orn, and Scion, along with Poppy, as far as on the engaged side of things. So Galio is kind of a really weird case. And I've, I've had a lot of comments. I've had a lot of people talk about Galio. Is he a Warden? Is he a Battle Mage? Is he a Vanguard? That type of stuff. He's really kind of a, a really cool champion where he links all three of those classes together. I do think he does belong in the Warden class, but he is a really interesting champion. And it's very strange how they keep adjusting his numbers, which push him more towards being a Battle Mage or push him more to being a Warden. Once again, there's the Spectrum for you guys. Um, 
makes sense, all kind of feeds towards each other. I did also attempt to turn this into like a 3D model where I could show like almost like a, a cloud or like a nebula with the champions and how they all relate to each other. I failed miserably. Uh, I'll be honest with that. I failed miserably. This is the closest I could get. I know I showed this in season nine. I wasn't able to make any more progress on it. But this is what the spectrum looks like um, if you if you actually matched it up to the uh, relationships that I showed throughout this video. So this is kind of like the pretty version. This is the more messy version. So uh, you can see like here, I've got juggernauts linking to battle mages. And this one, juggernauts don't link to battle mages. So this one is a little bit more accurate, but it's a little bit messier. So you can see like, if you want to move from juggernauts to vanguards, you go through the diver class. So juggernaut, diver, vanguard. If you want to go say from juggernauts to burst mages, you would go juggernauts to battle mages to burst mages. So you can see how every single class relates um, within a few champions. Like it only takes like four or five champions to get from one champion to any other champion um, within this diagram. The hardest ones to get to are obviously enchanters uh, because they're only related to catchers and wardens. But for most other classes and most other champions, they're all related. There's, there's only like a few champions in between any other champion. So I think that's kind of cool. It kind of shows how everything is on a spectrum. Everything is related. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. All right, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Once again, this video was part of my How to Find Your Ideal Champion stream, which occurred on January 11th. There will also be a video that talks about the main portion of How to Find Your Ideal Champion, which involves the attribute system that helps you pick which subclasses are best for you. That video has already been released. And then additionally, I'll be doing a video on the ranged classes, which should be released a few days after this video. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. This is Randomonium signing off.